Just a couple of words about Ukrainian Institute London. We are a UK-based charity uh, affiliated with the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, Ukraine. And so we contribute on a regular basis to a well-informed debate about Ukraine in this country. And this event is supported by the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, um, a Canadian-based foundation uh, also contributing to Ukrainian Jewish dialogue. We are very lucky to have the film director and a uh, um, historian uh, with a specialization in the history of Eastern Europe and Ukrainian family in particular, Andrew Tkach and Anne Applebaum. So, uh, I would like to start the discussion with my question addressed to Andrew. Uh, obviously, it's a complicated, multi-layered film. It's a film about Ukrainian famine, it's a film about the war in Ukraine, it's a film about rare climate, and it's a film about propaganda. Uh, how did this idea come about, and how challenging was it to bring all these threats together in, in one film? Well, the idea came to me because uh, the research done by Yars, who you heard from uh, before the film, uh, was sent to me, and I was already in Kenya, and they basically sent me uh, 24 articles and asked me if I wanted to compete uh, for uh, a grant that the Canadian government had uh, to uh, do a film about her. And, you know, I was very reluctant because I had never done actually films about the past. I'd only worked on, you know, present day, as some of the people here know. And, uh, but I locked myself in the room for uh, a weekend and I found her voice so captivating uh, that I quit, I just wrote the script basically uh, that you saw here um, in one weekend, just using entirely her own words. But, you know, having worked in Ukraine just previous to this on a film uh, called Generation I Down about the revolution, I, I very much felt that, you know, the, a film that was only about the past would not have as much resonance. In other words, that these same patterns continued up to this present day. Uh, so I, I felt it essential to find a story that communicated what was happening now and to communicate the problem of disinformation. So that is was the origin of you know, the Honda story, and we can talk in detail, like, is it, shouldn't it have been a contemporary journalist, uh, or was it better to focus on a war story? But my feeling was that um, the film also works on an emotional level, and uh, to do a portrait of a family caught up in these great historical dramas was, was more impactful than just strictly uh, disinformation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you comment uh, extensively on um, uh the scope and the methods of Russian propaganda uh, deployed uh, against Western democracies, against Ukraine. You're also a historian um, on Ukraine's famine. Do you see a direct link between these two things? How these two strands <coughs> play out in the film? Would you comment on that? I, I mean, actually, I, when I first watched the film, I was struck by you know, your decision to do exactly that. I mean, there's a clear parallel to uh, made between the past and the present. Um, my book is, re the book I wrote is not, doesn't really do that, that's not the point of it. It's a book that's really about um, the fan and how it happened, but it was impossible given the, I mean, one of the oddities about my book was that I started it in, I think, 2012, when Ukraine was a sort of boring, you know, increasingly authoritarian country, sorry, not, you know, not much in the news. Um, and my publisher and agent said, well, why are you, you know, why this subject? It seems, you know. Uh, and then, of course, we got to 2014, and suddenly Ukraine was on the front pages every day. Why aren't you finished yet? You know, where is this book? And it's a, it actually took me an extra, extra couple of years. Um, but it was impossible not to think about the parallels between the past and the present when writing the book, although I, 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 I confined my discussion of it to the last part because I wanted the book to be understood as a piece of history and not as a commentary on the present directly. But I thought you did it very well in the film. You know, this, um, the, the, the Putin's obsession with Ukraine is very similar in some ways to Stalin's obsession with Ukraine and kind of for similar reasons that um, Ukraine is that piece of the first of the Soviet empire and um, now of the Russian sphere of influence which is least reliable and which, um, and which um, you know, you know and, and, whose, and whose rebellion could have the biggest impact in Moscow itself. 
Um, Stalin was very obsessive about the idea that Ukraine, because during in 1918, Ukraine had rebelled against the Bolshevik army, and there had been an enormous peasant rebellion that had pushed back against them. And Stalin remained obsessed with the idea that this could happen again. Um, and when I was writing the book, I, when I got to the years 1932 and 33, when Stalin is kind of obsessing about the Ukrainian famine and the, which you you also talk about in the film, and the um, the, the the revolt against it, um, he immediately begins to talk again about 1918. He sort of refers back to that period and mentions it. So it's clear that he's worried that Ukraine will uh, will rebel and that the rebellion will have an impact in Moscow itself and could be a threat to the whole revolution. And it's a little bit like for Putin, you know, the, the Ukrainian Maidan in 2014 was exactly his nightmare. I mean, this is what he was afraid of, sort of young people uh, waving EU flags, calling for democracy and rule of law and, and, and human rights and an end to corruption. I mean, this is his nightmare. He's afraid of that kind of crowd in Moscow. He's afraid that those ideas um, you know, those ideas will come to Russia. I mean, there's a way in which, um, you know, the, the, the Ukraine turned towards the West, and particularly this turn towards Europe and this, and, and the, the admiration for the ideals of Europe and of the, of the European Union are, are a real ideological threat to Putinism, which is based on a completely different political system, you know, a corrupt oligarchy, um, quasi-dictatorship, um, you know, and this manipulation of reality that is that uh, rather rather than some idea of objective news and, and thinking, and so Ukraine remains this this uncertain neighbor. You know, this that, that could influence Russia itself, um, and I think that's the parallel between the past and the present. And I thought that came out very clearly in the film. How do you think uh, the uh, issue of propaganda um, could be explained? What was happening back then and what is happening now? Obviously, this issue is very much at the forefront of, of the events. Um, in the 1930s, the Soviet authorities did a very great job at limiting access to the information about famine. They massaged the data of the census, um, and they even uh, the photographs that we are having today. Um, you know, uh, there are not so many of them. Um, now we live in the. Uh, in the era of the internet, where pretty much every individual, you know, can become a media outlet. Um, but what impact does it have on propaganda? Does it make it uh, easier to control the access to the truth, in your view? Well, I think um, there's a very interesting point that Ad made in the film is that just as in uh, the 1930s, which saw the origin of radio being used as mass communication. It allowed dictators like Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, who were masters of radio to uh, break through kind of the monopoly of traditional news information because they could use it in a demagogic fashion. Uh, the same thing can be said now of the internet, as we can see. You know, not just Putin, Trump, and other you know, demagogues can use it to their own advantage and in that sense go beyond the control or the self, self, you know, criticism or the editorial rules that traditional media employs. So I think the disinformation going back to Stalinist times can be, you know, directly linked to today. It's just that today the, the medium has changed, um, and also the assault on traditional media has totally changed. And you've been just you've been quite critical of the impact the social media have on uh, the situation with truth and post-truth era that we are living in now. Uh, could you comment on that a little bit? Sure. So um, um, Andrew's already has already said a little bit about this. The, the 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 Soviet system was of course based on. I mean, propaganda is really the wrong word for it. Uh, um, you know, deliberately a deliberately designed attempt to shape reality in a particular way that was favorable to the, um, to the Soviet rulers. Um, the, you know, and, and often to create deliberately false images and, 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 and false stories. Um, the modern Russian state inherited that tradition. Um, it, you, know, in the, the, you know, the KGB had whole departments dedicated to creating fake stories. And I mean, the most famous one was the the story that the CIA had invented AIDS, which is, you may or may not remember, was a, 
very important kind of 1980s rumor, and it was a big deal, and particularly in places like Malaysia and India, where it was propagated and pushed as a way of discrediting the United States. So they had a whole department of people who were devoted to doing that and leaking that story to friendly newspapers around the world and, and getting them to push it. Um, and when, um, as the, you know, the, the, the people who were behind that kind of disinformation were, of course, still there in one form or another, and all they went kind of dormant in the 1990s, um, the, the invention of the internet gave it new life. And I, I think the Russians were among the first to understand the possibilities that the internet prevented for doing disinformation, not in exactly the same way in the past, but in a much more accelerated, um, much more, um, you know, much, you know, a more kind of mass way than had been even possible before. Um, they understood the possibility, you know, that you can create fake websites and you can create fake identities and then eventually you can create fake forms of amplification so that you can, you know, you create botnets that make things appear to be popular that aren't and, and attract people's attention to them. Then they began studying how you could shape conversations using, using these kinds of tactics. And while I don't think there's anything especially Russian about the way they did it, they were the first to put a lot of state resources into doing this, A, in trying to understand it and study it, and B, in trying to, um, you know, in putting people full, giving people the full-time job of manipulating the internet. And that, you know, we saw, we've seen some of the results of that um, in the US elections. I mean, I saw them earlier in Ukrainian elections and Polish elections. Um, but they, you know, they, they, they spent a lot of time studying how this could be done. Um, and so the, in a way, it's a Soviet tradition. It's not exactly the same because the Soviet, Soviet disinformation was all about convincing people to be pro-Soviet. I mean, this is, this is how it worked abroad. You know, the idea was that the Soviet state is right and the ideals of communism are correct and there's one way to do things and, it, you know, you must be pro-us. And Russian disinformation does not work like that. Um, the Russian state doesn't really care if you like Russia or not. They're not interested in winning converts to a cause. They don't, you know, they're not bothered what you think of Putin. They don't care at all. They're, but they, they've used instead these kinds of tactics as undermining tactics. So to undermine um, democracies, to, in, to, to amplify the voices of extremist parties in Europe, it's, they're very focused on anti-European parties. Um, because precisely because, as I was saying, they see Europe as this threatening ideology, as they saw, you know, as, as, it, as it was in, in the Maidan, and they and they do it, and it, it's had they have a different strategy for each country. In some places, it's been more successful, and in some places, you don't really notice it. Um, I think there's a there were it, well, we know there's now an ongoing argument about how much it mattered here in Britain um, during the Brexit campaign. And my, my sort of initial instinct was that it didn't matter that much here because the native, you know. The, the, the natives had already figured out the same tactics. Um, but maybe we're going to learn that Russian money um, also mattered here. Um, disinformation is usually part of a, a, there's a whole set of tactics that are used for political inference. So disinformation plus political bribery plus sometimes support for political parties plus, I mean, there's a range of, um, a range of things. Um, but, but, you know, it, it has its origins in the Soviet Union in the sense that that way of thinking about the world, you know, that the point of, you know, what is conflict and what is warfare, it's shaping, it begins with shaping the conversation and framing the debate and that, you know, that what you need to do is to begin to do that. That's something that comes from the Soviet era and, and continues today. Well, the World Cup is about to open in Russia. Um, and obviously um, it will be happening against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine and also the fact that some 60 Ukrainian citizens uh, are now in Russian jails. And one of them is just like you, is a film director, he's called Oleg Sensov, uh, who's been um, convicted uh, to 20 years of imprisonment in Russia for the alleged terrorist activities. He's a native of Crimea and just most recently he went on a hunger strike. Um, hoping to draw the attention of the global community to his plight. Um, is this a story that draws much attention in the media, and if not, why not? I think it doesn't draw a lot of attention at the moment. I mean, this is the first time I think most people have tried to bring, you know, sense of up 
to the public debate. Of course, Sensop himself says he's on a hunger strike, not for himself, uh, but specifically to free the 70 Ukrainians that are currently being held by Russia. And, and the cases are, are, to say the least, bizarre in the extreme. I mean, there is uh, the case of Sushchenko, who is a Paris, was a Paris-based journalist um, for Union, the, one of the press services, and he went to Moscow on a private visit, and uh, somebody passed him a DVD, a person he had known for 28 years, you know, as a favor to take to somebody. That's the evidence in his espionage trial. And he was just sentenced two days ago, 12 years in prison. Uh, there's the case of a young man named Harib, uh, who at 17 years old was in a social media conversation with another girl in, like, uh, I think it's in Rostov or in South Russia. Um, it was, you know, basically kind of a love, kind of a date kind of thing, but they had been saying things that were pro-Ukrainian also on the websites. And uh, he was lured to go to Belarus uh, to meet this girl and never came back. Uh, he was taken hostage, basically, and is now in, uh, in a Russian jail in the Rostov and is not allowed consular visits and it suffers from you know, medical problems. I mean, it, the list goes on and on, and it, it's, it's just incredible the, the level of kind of cynicism, like you don't know could they have possibly planned all these scenarios because they're so absurd. Um, then also we have, uh, sorry, we also have, uh, I, I do have to mention Juan Dog. Uh, I mean, I speak to his family on a regular basis. So this film, right now, um, he is in prison for over 1,100 days. Okay? He's never seen his youngest daughter, of course. You know, she's uh, now, you know, she's now like two years older. So uh, there, are, there were prisoner releases, but they held on to high value prisons, basically prisoners, basically special forces, uh, you know, that, uh, that Wander was, and, and be, anybody who sort of showed any kind of leadership capability probably, uh, they're high value targets. And, and you know, they're, they're being kept in, ironically, you know, they were kept in the, the KGB uh, basements where the, where the archives were previously, in the same exact shelves that you saw in the film. There's a little interesting detail, Serge Zakharov, who did the artwork in, in, that you saw the animation in the war scenes, he was a, uh, a Ukrainian Banksy, basically. Uh, that during, uh, when the uh, Donetsk rebels first took over uh, you know, the city, um, he, he famously put out like street art, the most famous one, and was of Strelkov with a gun to his head saying, just do it. And Strelkov was a, a Russian uh, GRU uh, in, uh, operative. So he, he was in one of my films previously, and I asked him to do the, the drawings because he actually had experienced these things himself. So I don't know, you know, this is obviously an attempt, you know, during the World Cup to bring all these issues to attention. But I'm sure every Ukrainian here knows every one of these stories. But, you know, most Westerners probably just know, sort of not even really aware that there's a war going on, you know. Um, that in the last month there were like 60 people killed, I think, right? one of the highest death tolls uh, of, you know, the last year. Uh, and it was important for me, you know, to, you know, to, to remind people of that, you know, that it's not just academic, that it's an actual conflict and there are actual victims. Thank you very much. Now we have about 20 minutes for questions. So, please. Question. I'm sorry. So you said that uh, Putin was scared of Russia. Well, he, he, well, Putin, he, he wasn't. He was not. He's not scared. Sorry, Putin's not scared of Ukraine in the sense of being militarily scared of it. It's not a. It's not a threat. Um, but 
it's more that the you know the ideology or the ideology is maybe the wrong word the ideals of Europe of democracy of <laughs> rule of law of uh, you know the, these ideals are a threat to his political system because his political system is based on a different set of principles. Um, you know, there is no rule of law in Russia. The state can take things from people at will. Um, the, the, there is no, um, you know, there, there's no, it's, it's not just that there are no elections, there's also no free press, there's no independent judiciary, there are no independent institutions. Um, and the, what the Ukrainians were protesting in favor of, what they said they wanted, was those things. And so when he saw, you know, young people waving EU flags in, Maidan, what he was afraid of was that that those kinds of ideas coming to Russia. So that was the, it wasn't that he thought they were going to invade Russia because that's, that, you know, wasn't ever going to happen. But it was, it was more that the, he's afraid that there will be that kind of revolution in Moscow. I mean, and actually there had been in 2011, there was this big, very major protest in Moscow right after, because he, he, he ran for, he sort of semi-legally, it's not clearly whether it was legal, or he ran for re-election having said that he, having already served two terms as president, so in what looked like a constitute, violation of the Constitution, and there were a lot of <coughs> protests against his, his re-election, and he, you know, which had some of the same characters, those protests in Ukraine, and he was afraid, um, you know, he, you know, his, his fear is that there will be that kind of revolution in Russia, that young Russians will be inspired by the same things that inspired young Ukrainians, and they will throw him out. So that, and that's what I meant. Um, but no, he's not. No, he obviously wasn't afraid, particularly of the Ukrainian army. In fact, although I think he rather underestimated the Ukrainian army, which in the end did fight and did fight back in, um, in not in Crimea, but later on in eastern Ukraine. Any other questions? So a little bit off topic, but um, it's all right. Do you have any theories about the Malaysian Airlines that was shot down? I, well, we, you don't need to have theory. We yeah, know what happened. What I, was there, I mean, there was a, the Dutch. Um, just, I mean, you can talk about it too. I'll, I mean, there was a, there was a, there's been a report that named not only the the kind of missile that was used, but the exact missile brigade that shot it. I mean, we know who it was. It was a Russian. Um, it was a team of Russians who came over the border and who were supporting the. You know, there's this fake separatist movement in eastern Ukraine. They are, you know, they were created by the Russians and they are supported by the Russian regular army. And a set of Buk missiles were brought over the border to help them and they'd been shooting down Ukrainian military planes. And so they, um, and they, I mean, I don't think they intended to shoot down the Malaysian airliner. Yeah, that's my question. No. no, no, they didn't, they didn't mean to shoot it down, but they, but they, they thought it was a Ukrainian plane. But I do. You want to say something about it, and then I can talk about the. Well, there's the been a Dutch, you know, prosecutor who's actually, you know, named uh, the evidence specifically, and I think they'll name the the, uh, the suspects because yes, the one thing about social media uh, is that everything is online, uh, and everything can be you know dug out. So they almost everything. Yeah, you know, so they you know that's posted. The Russian soldiers were posting all this stuff, um, and so. Uh, there is a trail of like that truck when it went and the missile when it was gone and the day when it came back and so on and so on. So they're like the guy who appeared in the film like Inform Napalm, they're the kind of group there like cyber kind of warriors that do all this kind of digging. Uh, and a lot of it is, is it's all from open sources, you know, except of course there is intelligence too that other people gather. Uh, there's also, there was a recording uh, of the Russian, uh, in, you know, backed uh, militia leader saying, we just shot down a Ukrainian plane, like, what, 20 seconds later, so, oops, no. But how could they have got that so wrong? I mean... Well, you know, the, the Americans shot down an Iranian passenger plane, you know, at, during one of the Gulf Wars, right? I mean, it is possible to make mistakes, but first of all, they would have had to admit that they invaded a foreign country, and that they had forces in there. So it was just, they had to have a lie immediately. Actually, you know, it's more interesting than that. It's, in, in fact, the most, it's a really interesting moment because it compares a lot to the Russian reaction to the Skripal case here, 
what was really important about the Russian reaction to the shooting down of that plane was it wasn't just that they denied it, they put out a dozen stories, two dozen stories about who did it. And some of them were plausible and some of them were implausible. There was one story that you know, the plane took off loaded with dead bodies on purpose, and then it, you know, they took it down on purpose to sort of discredit Putin. And then there was another theory that, the, you know, some Ukrainians had been trying to shoot down Putin's planes. So they invented like a dozen insane things um, put out all at once with a very clear goal. And the goal was to denigrate the idea of truth itself. And there was actually a very good series of interviews that I think it was done by Radio Liberty, the American back, American uh, radio station um, in Moscow did a series of interviews with on the street with people after that happened. And they said, well, who do you think shot down this plane? And what a lot of people said was, we have just no idea. There's no way to prove anything and so on. That was exactly what um, the Russian media did after the poisoning of the Russian, the ex-spy here in Britain. Um, the, I, you know, I saw a list at one point of the numbers of, of the explanations and there were something like 35 and there were, you know, the, the, you know, that Theresa May did it, you know, to distract from Brexit. And, um, you know, the, the some, some, you know, Czechs did it for some other reason. And there were, it was, I mean, there was literally two dozen different explanations, some kind of maybe plausible, you know, somebody escaped from Porton Down, you know, from the British chemical labs or somebody, and some of them were vaguely, and some of them were just insane, you know, a drone did it, you know, or, or Skripal's mother-in-law did it. I mean, there were uh, all kinds of stuff. And, and the purpose of doing a, a disinformation campaign like that is to make everybody think, well, this is all so insane, and we just have no idea, and we just can't possibly believe anybody. And that, that's, the, that's the point of it. And that's a very, very important um, now Russian tactic. I mean, it's actually not only Russian. It's, you know, um, it's been used in the United States around, um, and it's used in other countries to, you know, if you, in, in a way, it's more now that people, we have so many sources of information and so many different um, voices in the public, it's, it's in a way a much more effective way of discrediting a story than just denying it. Because if you're just denying it, you know, you're just one person. Whereas if you put out 13 crazy stories, um, you can make people just, people eventually begin doubting that there can be any truth at all. Can we ever know what happened? No, it will always be a mystery. In the beginning of, of the war, of the information war, war Ukraine, um, Ukraine did struggle to, to fight with, with Russia in, in this media war. And all the actions which were done by the activists, by the government, seemed to be very small comparing to Russia's uh, influence in media. And do you think there is a chance that Ukraine is taking over Russia in, in the war? And if not, what should be done? Well, I don't know. Ukraine, you know, had a lot of very positive, you know, news and media coverage during the Maidan, uh, you know, uh, uprisings and during the Orange Revolution, you know. So, you know, you have to see it from the media's point of view. I mean, it, you know, there's a story that's covered and then the world moves on, you know. But uh, in terms of, you know, the, the, the mistake that sometimes Ukraine makes, as we saw recently with the you know, the journalist who was revived after supposedly killed, is they were still in that same Soviet mindset that, you know, the end justifies the means, right? Um, I think that there is a, a new generation, um, like young people, filmmakers, like the group that I was working with, pretty much exclusively was Babylon 13. You know, they, it's a cultural thing also that you have to get beyond this kind of constant belief in conspiracies and and that uh, somehow somebody's always pulling the string. You just have to be honest with the facts and you have to represent what you see and, you know, the chips fall where they may. You know, you can't constantly be seeing it as, you know, one giant conspiracy. I would say, actually, you know, Ukraine has had a, it's been pretty transformational, the image of Ukraine in the world over the last, um, you know, over the last four or five years. I mean, as I, I described my publisher's reaction to my idea of writing a book about Ukraine from kind of being not that interested to being angry that I wasn't finished yet. So um, the, 
the, the Ukrainians have done, I think, a better job than they sometimes give themselves credit for in telling their story. And it's a combination of you know, the younger Ukrainians who've been able to speak well about it and um, some, I mean, the, the, the people have different views about the president of Ukraine, but he's actually been a very good spokesman for the country outside of the country. Um, and more generally, the, the narrative of Ukraine as a country that is trying to break free, free from this post-Soviet model of corruption um, and to create something more, you know, if, if not more democratic than anyway, more just than, than, than previously is something that people in the West find very appealing. Um, and there's certainly more, there are a lot of prominent friends of Ukraine, both in politicians and journalists and intellectuals, um, who might not have even heard of the country a few years ago. So it's a, um, I think, you know, you know, Ukrainians should remember that that's changing. I mean, the other interesting thing is because, and uh, Marina knows about this, you know, Ukraine has been a kind of petri dish for this whole issue, um, the issue of disinformation some of which, you know, there were a lot of experiments done in Ukraine by the Russians um, initially, and then those experiments have then been taken, um, taken elsewhere. And Ukraine, but Ukraine has also been a kind of experimental, uh, you know, a place where people experiment with responses to disinformation. And so the first really interesting, you know, NGO dedicated to disinformation, which is this organization called Stop Fake, um, was born in Ukraine, and Ukrainians have experimented with all the different kinds of ways of fighting disinformation, both regulatory and, you know, civil society, and, you know, through, the, you know, they're, tr they're trying out different tactics, um, and in a way, they're, the, a lot of the experiments about how we're gonna, how we're gonna cope with this issue, which is now an issue for, in Britain, and the United States, and France, and Germany, um, Ukraine has been a place where a lot of things have been tried, and so it may, it may even eventually have a bigger role than we expect, and sort of people may go to Ukraine to learn how to deal with this subject. Um, I actually just completely coincidentally two days ago um, met a guy from who works for a part of Google, and he had just spent several days in Ukraine doing that. I mean, sort of meeting people who were fighting. I mean, I actually don't like the expression "information war" because it sounds like. I know it's a bit too Orwellian for me, um, but but, but so that who'd been who'd, but he had met lots of people who were working on disinformation in Ukraine and how to think about it, and he was very inspired by that. So who knows? This lady has been asking, and I just want. I just. Can we get the press? Oh, hi. Um, I was just really curious what you both felt about Ria's story. Um, I found it really interesting that she was so accurate uh, and 24 stories that you read that made you write the script all at once and then following me through and that there's only that one photo of her or yes. two. It's really startling. So I just wondered what you thought about her story, why she disappeared, what happened and, and how that she did report the truth and it got buried because she was a freelancer, she didn't matter, it didn't get carried. I mean, I, I can see that happening today, so sure. I, it's sort of interesting. Yeah, I can give so some why don't you talk about Rhea? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, she is, you know, kind of, you know, the, the paradigm of, like, somebody who does not ignore the facts as, and where the chips, you know, fall as they may. You know, she came to Moscow wanting to write about the Great Workers' Revolution. There's no question about that. And, you know, unlike there was a whole Western pool of reporters uh, who were not really, you know, communists. I mean, she was probably a communist when she went there, um, you know, but they were living in this cocoon uh, that we find ourselves in Moscow often and, and protected by the government and given luxuries and sort of inevitably kind of repeating the government line. And she was somebody that went, she was, she was uh, you know, she had a wooden leg she, that she suffered as an accident. And she went, she managed to go to, Siberian was one of the first people to report on the gulag and I think what it was was I mean her values were as a journalist I mean that's what really struck me and that's why I really wanted to do the film right off you know the, the bat uh, was here's somebody who comes in with this preconception of what they're about to see and instead of kind of uh, you know kind of wishy-washy kind of trying to explain it just throws it all away because of what she sees in front of her right and, and then does that consistently, uh, first in the Arctic, uh, then in the Ukraine, 
uh, then in Nazi Germany. And when she went, um, after she was expelled from the Soviet Union, I know that, that she went to Canada uh, and basically said that, yes, I was treated as a hero, but all I could do was get non-paying gigs at women's clubs, right? You know? That's a change. Right, I know. As we know, it's, a, it's an industry dominated by men, and you can imagine what it was like in the 1940s, you know? So she never, ever had a staff job. She was a freelancer the whole time. All these articles were written uh, as a freelancer. Um, so, you know, that's why she never showed up in any of these records. All these other reporters who became more famous, they were tied to papers, whatever. It wasn't until, you know, somebody dug up all these articles and, and found out where she was, you know, in terms of the period and writing uh, that, like, the strength of her character came out. But, I, you know, that's why I think, you know, we can applaud, like, her hunger for truth. It was very simple. You know, it was just following the facts, going on hunches, and, and basically writing what she saw instead of what she was supposed to believe. And what was the story that stopped Hitler? Um, well, the only the only kind of uh, writ, uh, written sort of uh, manuscript I saw outside her articles, there was a book called uh, How I Got That Story. And it's a compilation, you know, by one of the news agencies from various journalists who were in the middle of, you know, the big events of World War II and post World War II. Uh, and the story was about uh, the Hitler's kind of push against Austria, right? And apparently, uh, there, was two there were two attempts. The first one was unsuccessful. And that's when she says, uh, how I stopped Hitler, because basically, it was like two or three years before they sent the stormtroopers into Austria. She actually went to the border because she was friends with somebody else who uh, was like, knew somebody from the, the party, and they knew about the social gathering on the border, that it was just a cover to get troops in there so they could invade. And she published all this, and Mussolini was not quite yet on board with, with Hitler and reacted like, well, wait a minute, Austria, you know, that's our territory. And, and that's why there was a bit of conflict between Mussolini and Hitler at the time, and so the invasion was delayed by two years. I don't know if it's, you know, she's it's making story. <laughs> too big a claim, but to stop, you know, Hitler, I don't think it takes a little bit more than Ray Kleinman, but in any case, that was the story. There was one other person right there. Yeah, just about like um, technically how you weaved it all together. Um, how was it? How was the process for you? I, mean, I, I think we can ask an editor here <laughs> how that works. There's two editors here we worked with in the past, both Lisa and Les, um, and you know it's very complicated. But you know you try to you try to go on. Uh, you know, on the themes, I mean, of course, I don't know, you can tell me as an audience, did it work to have the parallel stories? There's also a 50 minute version, which is much straighter, like goes like an arrow, and it's just Rhea's story, right? Um, it's much simpler to understand, and the message is much simpler. So this one is much messier, you know, but um, does it get resolved in the end? I don't know, you know. You... Well, I, I like very much that we followed Rhea's story. Yes. And it, that, it did sort of hold it together, and it was sort of, you know, you could sort of feel an affinity with her. I was like, she's like a Ma Martha Gellhorn before there was a Martha Gellhorn, and, you know, why haven't we heard about her before? And, and so, yeah, beautifully done. But did you feel that the, the story of the prisoner of war and the conflict was, and the past history, was it all tied together effectively or not? I felt it was very emotionally acute. So that I thought your observation about it being a family in the conflict now, because I think as a regular news reader or, and not working in the field, I think the story keeps getting forgotten, and it's 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 a very odd phenomenon that this continual place of conflict gets forgotten. And when you hear it in a simpler voice, it calms you down and you hear it more clearly. So I think your instincts were very good. No, we have an opposing point of view. I saw your head check. Yeah. Go ahead, tell us why not. Andrew, I, I apologize. I will have to stop just for one second because I think I need to pluck out Anna Bogdan from this discussion because her taxi has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and she will have to we can, we can really finish this one question that. if you want. Yeah, why, why were you yeah. shaking your head? No, I mean, you can be totally honest. 
honestly, no, it, it didn't resonate uh, with me. It was, as, as my companion was saying, that the story of Ria did, that was emotionally compelling. I, I do human rights work on Ukraine, so I do a lot of work on, on, on the conflict. I, I'm not opposed to it. I, I, I agree also with this lady. There was an emotional resonance with the present, but <coughs> I didn't feel it did justice to the enormity, um, I, I, to, 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 to contrast the enormity of the famine with the forgotten. And it's not entirely, I mean, it depends what, what peak you belong to. Uh, or I thought it was an interest, interesting, because I know what your problem was with, I, I know what the problem was with Rhea is you don't have film of her, you know, and you can't interview her. And so as a documentary maker, it must have been difficult to figure out how do you, you know, and so you chose to tell a kind of a parallel side story about a similar place, you know, in, a, in, a, in another moment of crisis. And so I thought it was interesting, but, but no, they were different, obviously they're different kinds yeah. of stories. It, it, it but they have some similar themes, I mean there's this theme about truth and there's this theme about yeah. dictatorship and yeah. so. I felt that the, the term for me is, it's a fact we never hit it. Seems to be, it's a fact we never hit it. It's hidden, it's forgotten continually, it's just mm -hmm. this endless cycle, so I felt that the way your metaphors worked and the images, it, you could feel the conflict constantly rolling through. So it, 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 I thought it was effective. Yeah, I'm not in the field, so I know that. Yeah, I mean, it's a subjective point of view that, you know, hopefully it works. I've seen it both ways. I mean, there are many people, you know, it's a valid opinion either way, believe me. Um, anybody else have any final thoughts? I'd like to mention the following. Uh, maybe you have, you have forgotten that in the movie, that during the whole of the war, I know it was a movie about a Canadian uh, reporter, a journalist, but what wasn't highlighted, maybe for the British public to know, that the United Kingdom was buying the grain from the Soviet Union mm -hmm. while 10 million people yeah. starved of hunger. I think that's important to know, because unfortunately, no, no matter which British government will be in power, they will refuse to acknowledge that. They still refuse to acknowledge that the whole of the war is a genocide against the Ukrainian nation. I'm self from Ukrainian background and I'm thinking in which century are we living? It's so difficult to give in to say, yes, we made a mistake, but they're buying the grain from the Soviet Union while many people knowingly they knew it very well were dying of hunger. What is your thought on that? It's more complicated to say they really knew it. Um, this is a, maybe for a longer conversation. You know, I think it's important to know that nobody recognized the famine. I mean, um, not in Britain, not in France, not in Germany, not, not the Vatican, not Poland, which was right next to Ukraine. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a really complicated moment in history. This is 1933, when um, Hitler had, and there's, you know, and people, and I should say, it's even weirder than that, because people, some people knew, so some diplomats knew, and some journalists knew, and in my book on the famine, there's a whole chapter on this, so you can, you know, I document who knew, and who knew what, and who recorded it when, and so on. Um, and yet there was, it's pretty clear that the broader public did not know, and there was no broader feeling about it, and part of that was because in 1933, Hitler had just come to power, and lots of people said, well, there may be something happening in Ukraine, but we have a bigger problem coming, and we need to worry about that. And some of it was because the fact that Stalin was hiding it made people doubt it. So people said, well, if there really was this terrible thing happening, wouldn't the government say so? Because 10 years earlier, there had been another famine in the Soviet Union in 1920-21, and there had been a public um, you know, there, there had been public involvement in foreign aid and so on. And, and I think there's also a kind of lack of belief, you know, people just couldn't believe something like that would be hidden and people had trouble believing that Stalin would deliberately starve his own people, which he did. And I mean, I, this is, by the way, I'm not saying this is a way to excuse anybody. This is not a justification, just a, um, it's a really interesting case study to look at this question of what people know and when they know it. Um, and how it affects them. And you can almost have this same conversation about the war in eastern Ukraine, which goes on right now. People are dying. People die every day. Um, it sort of goes up and down. You know, sometimes it's worse and sometimes it's less. And does it really affect anybody here? Does anybody, even, I mean, even in neighbor countries that are neighboring Ukraine, are they, 
Are people moved by it? Do they care about it? I mean, some people do, but um, you know, put, think you know. What, it's important to think about how, you know how, what do we know about other people's atrocities? When do we react to it? Um, it usually requires something more than mere knowledge. It requires some kind of political movement or emotional movement or media coverage or some you know there there's off, you know you need something more to happen for people to really care. And I don't know what that magic ingredient is. Well, I think Stalin knew, and that was an image, and that's exactly why he. Uh, was why there are no pictures. Right yeah. there. I mean, Samara, who is here, or was here. Uh, her great grandfather was the one that took those pictures, and that's the only record. Those, the, those, the, yeah, those are the only good right. pictures. Yeah. And uh, the other thing too, just to keep in mind, I mean, I do work in Africa most of the time, and just before I left, there was a story about South Sudan, and. Um, the woman was talking about how the famine season is coming because I'm feeding my family with, you know, leaves from a tree. And I just like, you know, well, it's almost the exact same line in this film. So we have to keep that in mind as well. You know, how many of us really know, care, or are going to do anything about the South Sudan famine, which is happening today, right? So. Try to keep that in mind also when, when thinking about you know historical injustice and, and and what needs to be brought to the forefront in front of an audience in front of the public. Um, I think you know we all are if we're really committed for the truth we, we, we can't be uh, provincial about it. We have to support everybody's you know struggles. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> thank you.